in the life and ministry of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, the account of which we read together in the reading at the beginning, as it is to be found recorded in the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. And in particular this evening, I should like to direct attention to the tenth verse, the tenth verse in the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Now, I want to call attention not merely to the contents of that particular verse, but rather to that which is suggested by the verse, namely the whole attitude of these Jews, which really means here primarily the Pharisees, to our Lord and Saviour. Now, last Sunday evening we were considering this incident as it is a portrayal of the great gospel of salvation which we meet together to consider. It is an actual historical fact and event. What we read here literally and actually happened. I don't understand a man who is in, is in difficulties about miracles. If you believe that the Son of God rarely came down into this world, you shouldn't be surprised if you read that he worked miracles. And he did. And this miracle actually took place. But we were concerned about it not only in and of itself, but as it is a portrayal and representation of this wondrous and glorious gospel of salvation. But now tonight I want to direct attention to the response to that. Here it is, it took place. And any event such as this of necessity produces some kind of a response. And this incident produced a response. And what we are told here is of the two responses to the one and same incident. We have on the one hand the response of these Jews. And on the other hand we have the response of the man who was healed. And you notice that they are diametrically different and opposed. Uh, surely we all must uh, feel as we read this uh, story, this incident, this account, a sense of surprise and of amazement as we read of the response of these Jews. Never perhaps has the word therefore had such a strange significance as it has in this particular tenth verse. And that is why I'm taking it as my text. Especially taking it in connection with verse 9. Listen. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the, and on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore, therefore, because of what had just happened, said unto him that was cured it is the sabbath day it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed notice the therefore because of the miracle because of the healing because of the curing because of this miraculous and supernatural thing which had just taken place what a reaction what a response how different, I say, from the response of the men who was healed. Now, my point is that surely all this must come to us as something amazing and astounding and almost incredible. Isn't it almost beyond comprehension and beyond credibility that any man or any group of men could possibly react in this extraordinary manner to this momentous thing that had just taken place? And yet all of us who are familiar with the Gospels are not surprised because as you read through these Gospels that's what you find, isn't it? Our Lord performed miracle after miracle. He worked these deeds of kindness and of compassion. He relieved suffering. And yet what did he meet? Opposition. Scowling. 
questions, attempts to trap him and to ensnare him, malignity on the part of these Pharisees and scribes and doctors of the law. On he goes, working his miracles, and they take up stones and throw them at him. He spoke as never men speak. Gracious words came over his lips, and yet they bared their teeth at him and snarled at him. And eventually they all joined together. People who formerly had been at enmity, like Pilate and King Herod, people who hadn't spoken for years, they came together and plotted together against him. Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees who were bitterly opposed all became one and they all of them joined together to cry away with him, crucify him and incited the people. And as we know, he ended his life upon a cross between two thieves. They hurled shame and scorn and derision upon him. That was his fate. That was the end of his life. Now, I'm just asking a question. Why was that? What explains that? What can account for such a response, such a reaction to these mighty things that were here done on the face of this earth by the Son of God? That's the question. And there is no more important question confronting the human race this evening than just this question. But let me make it perfectly plain and clear that I'm not putting this question to you this evening theoretically or in an academic manner. I'm not just standing here and saying, oh, this is an extraordinary phenomenon that we've got here in the pages of the four Gospels. Let's turn aside and look at it tonight and dissect it and analyze it. No, no, I'm not doing that. I'm doing that, but I'm not simply doing that. Our attitude must not be theoretical. Why? Well, because you and I this evening, every one of us, is in precisely the same position as these Jews of which we're reading. Because the whole case of this gospel is to say this, that as he confronted these people there in the days of his flesh, he's confronting the whole world this evening. That's the meaning of a preaching service such as this. It is that Christ is presented, that he confronts men and women who come and listen. So we are in the identical position of these very Jews of whom we read in this 10th verse. I say it's not a theoretical question. We all of us come face to face with this Christ, with this Jesus of Nazareth. And you know, it's as true to say tonight as it was in the days of his flesh that there are only two final responses to him. And every one of us in this congregation at this minute has made the one response or else the other. We are either like these Jews or else we are like the men who was healed. It's one or the other. And there is no evading these two possibilities. And there is no middle position between the two. Christ divides us. We are either for or else against. You can't be neutral. You can't be passive. If we are not for him, we are against him. Now, I'm not saying that. He said that himself. He that is not for me, he said, is against me. He said that his coming was like a sword that divides even mother and daughter, father and son, husband and wife, at once as we confront him, we are placed in a position where we've got to decide. And we do. If we do nothing, we're against. We're all of us either for him or against him. We're either, I say, in the position of the men healed, or else we are in the position of these Jews who therefore made this statement to the men whom our Lord had healed. And I would again remind you that there is no more important question that can ever come to any one of us than thus, than just this question. Which of these responses is ours? Uh, I don't apologize for being blunt and plain. I needn't, need I? What I'm really asking is this. When you sang that last hymn, 
Were you singing the words or only the tune? Were you singing your experience? Were you singing that which is true of you? Did you really mean it? How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It heals his sorrows, heals his wound, soothes his sorrows, heals his wound, and drives away his tears. Is that your experience? Is that your attitude to him? Can you say quite honestly that his name is sweet to you? That his name is above every other name to you? That he is the incomparable one, the one who stands alone? That's to be Christian. And that is the essence of Christianity. Either we can say honestly how sweet the name of Jesus sounds, or else we are in the position of these Jews. Now the you, it's, it's the you saying, ah, oh, I'm neither one nor the other. You must be one or the other. If you really believe in him, you must say that his name is sweet to you. If you don't, well, you can't say it. And if you don't say it, it means that you don't believe in him. You have never really faced him. You don't know him. No one can be apathetic in his presence. No one ever was in the days of his flesh. No one has ever been, ever since, who has ever heard of him. And therefore I say that this evening we are all of us in one of these two positions, and what makes it all so urgent is this, that according to what he goes on himself to say to these people, did you notice it in verse 23, that our eternal destiny depends upon this thing, what will decide how every one of us is going to spend eternity is our attitude to the Lord Jesus Christ. To those who can say that his name is sweet, we know that their eternity is to be one of bliss and of joy. And alas, it's got to be said, to those to whom the name of Jesus is not sweet, they have nothing to look forward to but misery and wretchedness and useless remorse. My dear friend, let me put my question again. What is your reaction to him? Well, in order to help in this self-examination tonight, let me put before you this case that is outlined here. Because here we see the whole thing placed before us in a very clear and in a very dramatic manner. And therefore, having looked at this, we'll be enabled to examine ourselves. That's the value of the scripture. That's the purpose of the record. That's the whole business of preaching is to bring all this to us, and we have it here in illustration. So I divide my matter up like this. First of all, let us again be quite clear in our minds at, as to what confronts the two groups. What was it that was confronting the Jews and the men? What is it that confronts everybody in the world tonight? Well, here it is quite simple. In the case of these people in the incident there, they were confronted by two things. The first, of course, was the miracle. And the second was the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the claims that he made for himself. Now, those are the two big things I think you'll all agree. Here is a person called Jesus of Nazareth and... He suddenly comes to this place, the pool of Bethesda. And there are all these people, this men in particular had been going there, carried there 38 years, impotent, unable to do anything for himself. And all the others, you remember, the blind, the lame, the impotent, the withered and so on, all desperate and hopeless, waiting for the stirring of the waters that they might get in first and be healed. Suddenly there walks into this Hopeless, helpless crowd, this person, this extraordinary person, Jesus of Nazareth. And he approaches this man and says, Wilt thou be made whole? And the man, you remember, makes his speech and says, What's the use of asking? I've been here so long and I've got nobody. I'm a poor man. I haven't got a servant to put me in. Everybody else is rushing in before me. I've nobody to put me in. It's always somebody else. And suddenly our Lord looked at the man and said, Wilt thou be made whole? Very well then. Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And the man 
immediately was made whole and took up his bed and walked. The miracle, the astounding miracle, it's confronting him, it's confronting the Jew. And then with it, I say, is the person. And the claims he makes for himself, they understood the claims all right. He looked at them, you remember, and said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but uh, had also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And they're quite right, that's exactly what he does mean. But there he is standing before them. He not only works the miracle, he speaks and he makes claim. And there they are, they're confronted by the two tremendous things. Now I'm saying that both parties were confronted by the same facts exactly. The same miracle, the same person, the same words, the same claim. Now, all that is equally true of everybody who's in the world this evening. It's true of Christians. It's true of those who are not Christians. Shall we therefore remind ourselves very hurriedly of the facts by which we are confronted? What is it that Christianity holds before men and women tonight? What are these things which I claim are facts confronting us? Well, I divide them up like this. Like this. First of all, take the Bible itself. Take this book. Here is a book that is confronting the human race tonight. What does it confront them with? What are the facts which it holds before them? Well, take your Old Testament. What do you find there? Well, you find that standing out prominently above everything else, is the history and the story of that people called the Jew. And what a story it is, what a remarkable story. How did they ever come into being? How do you account for the Jews? How do you account for the strange vicissitudes through which they passed? How do you account for the fact that this little race and this little country became so mighty at times? How do you explain it? How do you explain their persistence? in spite of all that is so true of them, and in spite of these mighty dynasties by which they were surrounded, how do you explain the phenomenon, the fact, of the Jew in history running right through the Old Testament, and you can trace it likewise in secular history? There it is. But take another fact that stands out prominently in the Old Testament. The fact of prophecy. There's a great deal of prophecy in the Old Testament. A number of things are foretold there. It's said quite categorically that certain things are going to happen. And in the Old Testament itself you can see some of them happening. Certain warnings that God gave to these people and they came to pass. Certain predictions that were made about some of them. About a man like uh, Abram at the age of 99 and his wife over 90. That they're going to have a son and the son came. These are the kind of things that confront you here. Not only that, there are still more specific things than that. There are prophecies and predictions as to someone who's going to come into this world that a virgin is going to give birth to a child. He's going to be born in a place called Bethlehem. All that's in the Old Testament. And many other details in a most amazing manner that he'll be of the tribe of David and all these other things. What's going to happen to him? The opposition he'll meet, the scorn and the persecution how he's going to ride into Jerusalem on the back of an, the foal of an ass. All these things in the Old Testament. Prophecy. Now there, I say, are some of the great facts in connection with the Bible that stand before us and insist upon some kind of a verdict with respect to themselves. Then, in addition to that, we turn over into the New Testament and what we find well here, standing out above everything and everybody, is this blessed person, Jesus of Nazareth. And what do we find here? Well, we find a person. We find a life lived. We find someone who, though born in poverty and never had any training at all, understands more about the law than the greatest experts and, experts and all the Pharisees. 
It's here, it's confronting us, this phenomenon that's been thrown up. Jesus, a carpenter, who can defy the doctors of the law at the age of 12, and when he goes out in his public ministry is unanswerable and cannot be refuted. A phenomenon works these miracles. All this is standing before us. His words, his teaching. And then the most amazing thing of all, his death. This man who could quell the raging of the storm at sea, who could heal the leper, give hearing to the deaf, make the blind see, raise an impotent man up like this by just a word, who could raise the very dead out of the grave, is arrested and in apparent weakness, is crucified and dies, and is buried in a grave, and the stone is rolled over to the, on the face of the grave. But, and here it is, the most momentous fact of all, he rose again, the resurrection, and revealed himself to chosen witnesses, 500 people together on one occasion. The resurrection. Here it is facing us. These are the claims, these are the statements about this person. And then add to this the story of the church. You remember the twelve crestfallen apostles, disciples, don't you? Who in spite of his teaching were completely shattered when he was crucified on the tree. Didn't understand and felt utterly hopeless and utterly disconsolate. But wait a minute, I notice in a few months these men are preaching about the place. One of them, the Apostle Peter, stands up in Jerusalem in the very center of the opposition, preaches one sermon, 3,000 people are converted. What's happened to him? What is this? Ah, this is the result of the resurrection and the result of the sending of the Holy Spirit. Now, the fact of the change in the Apostles is a fact of history. Christianity belongs to history. You'll find it in the secular records, even of the Roman Empire. It became a problem. It became a phenomenon. These Christians were charged with causing political uprisings. There it is in the secular history. The church, where has she come from? How do you explain her? A, a momentous, mighty fact, the Christian church. Trace her history and her story down the running centuries. See the attempt of the Jews at the very beginning to destroy her. See the attempt of the great mighty Roman Empire to exterminate her. See the attempt of Greek philosophy to throttle her and her teaching by ridicule and by cleverness and worldly wisdom. See these arise one after another against her and yet on she goes. This is a phenomenon. And then if you like, Take up your biographies. Begin to read about a man like Saul of Tarsus. Later the Apostle Paul. Read of Augustine. Oh, read of all these mighty men coming down through the centuries. Go and talk to them. Listen to them. See what happened to them. The change in their lives. The men they became. What they did. The greatest benefactors the world has ever known. Look at them. There they are standing before you. They're confronting you tonight. The fact. Now then, there is our position, isn't it? Before the Jews and this men, where the miracle and the Christ incarnate and his claim. And there I put very hurriedly and inadequately before you the phenomena, the facts, facing and confronting the human race at this very moment. Now then, let's look at the attitudes. First of all, let us look at the attitude of these Pharisees. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. You see their reaction, don't you? Annoyance, irritation, unbelief, rejection. What's the cause of this? That's the question. And my dear friend, let me remind you again that I'm doing all this 
in order that if you who are listening to me at this moment are not a Christian and you cannot say honestly how sweet the name of Jesus sounds, I'm trying to show you why you are in that condition. You're like these Jews. What accounts for their reaction? There's one word that puts it all, and it is the word prejudice. Nothing but prejudice, nothing whatsoever, but sheer prejudice, which is always the result of sin. Sin prejudices us against the truth of God. That's what it did away back at the beginning. And the devil knew how to use it so perfectly. He came to Adam and Eve and he said, Hath God said, <laughs> God's against you. Ah, at once the prejudice has been put in. God's against you. And the moment you get that prejudice, well, it's going to color everything you do and everything you say. It'll control all your thinking, and it'll all be blind. As Paul says in writing to the Corinthians, second chapter, fourth verse, and uh, fourth chapter and about fourth verse. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest they believe the glorious gospel of Christ. The trouble with every unbeliever, I say, is nothing but sheer prejudice. Because he doesn't believe that, he doesn't say that, he doesn't like that. He talks about knowledge, doesn't he? He talks about cleverness, talks about his brain, talks about uh, science, zeta, and so on. Wonderful advances, 20th century. No, so much, can't possibly believe it. But my dear friend, knowledge has got nothing whatsoever to do with it. I can prove that quite easily. It's purely a matter of prejudice. And I prove that, you see, like this. I can take the same men, the same men with the same brain, the same knowledge, the same everything. At one stage in his life he's against, then in the second stage he's for. With the same gigantic brain, with the same immense knowledge, with that vast erudition, with this command of science, whereas he formerly rejected, he now believes. But of course there is a case in the Bible itself that settles that point once and forever, and it is the case of the man whom we know as the Apostle Paul. As Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, hated Christ and would have exterminated his cause. And then the same men was converted and became a Christian. And he begins to sing how sweet the name of Jesus sounds, the same man. And he looks back and he says, why did I reject? Why was I against? And he says, I did it ignorantly in unbelief, prejudiced by sin and by Satan. And what a devastating thing prejudice is. Had you realized, my friend, that if you're not a Christian, you're just governed by, by prejudice, you're blinded by prejudice, and this is how it works. It's shown here very perfectly in this illustration. What did prejudice do to these men? Well, here's one thing it did. It meant that they were utterly preoccupied with their own difficulties and their own problems. And they were so much preoccupied with their own difficulties and their own problems that they couldn't see the big facts that were staring them in the face. Did you see that? The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. See, they don't see the cure. They see this man breaking the laws, they think. They see uh, some detail in their elaboration, false elaboration of the law, transgressed. They're preoccupied with their own ideas and their own thoughts and absolutely controlled by them. That's, you see, how prejudice does blind us. And isn't that the simple truth about all who are not Christians this evening? Yes, so they're so preoccupied with their own problems and own difficulties with regard to the scriptures and all these things that they see nothing but that. You know them, don't you? A man says, I'm not a Christian. And you say, well, why are you not a Christian? He says, you know, this Bible, it troubles me. Who was Cain's wife? And he can't believe it. 
doesn't say a word about Jesus Christ. Cain's wife, there it is. And that fish, whatever it was, that swallowed Jonah. And these miracles, well, I just can't, says the men, you know, I'm, sci- I'm a scientist, I'm scientifically trained. Miracles, they're, they're impossible. They're, there he is, all, every time you meet him, up it comes, miracles. I don't want to ridicule, but I am trying to present a true and a fair picture. And I think you'll have to admit it's true. People come to me and say, you know, I don't understand this. If you say there is a God, why does he allow war or this or that or the other? That's it. Always the same question. They come filled with their difficulties, their problems, the things they can't understand. And Christ is there the whole time. And they say nothing about him as if they'd never seen him. They're immersed in their own problems. These people here, they are, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed, they say to a poor man who hasn't been able to move for 38 years. I agree with you, it is a matter for laughter, and yet I'm not sure whether it's laughter or tears, that men can be so blinded and prejudiced, and so kept from the big things by these little things in which they're immersed and by which they're preoccupied. Their difficulties, their problems, this, that, and the other. Here they are. Let me hurry to the second. I've already mentioned it. Because of that, you see, you get their consequent failure to face the big facts. They can't see the wood because of the trees. Did you notice how it comes out in their very language? Notice the difference of the speech of the Jews and the men. The Jews therefore said unto him that was healed, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Listen to the men answering. He answered them, He that made me whole, he brings Christ in, he brings the miracle in. The same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, And now you'd expect to find here, who is this extraordinary man that has healed you? Not a bit of it. What man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? And the men couldn't answer them. And then the story goes on the whole time, you see. They miss the miracle. They don't say a word about it. They don't say a word about the healing of the men. It's just this question of the mat that he's carrying and the law and the Sabbath And they don't see the miracle, and they don't see the cure, and they don't really see this Christ. They miss the big things because they're immersed in the little ones. Isn't that still the trouble? Have you considered him, my friend? Have you looked at Jesus of Nazareth? Forget all about miracles for a moment. Forget about all these particular difficulties of yours. There are certain big things, I've already enumerated them, that are standing before you, confronting you, belonging to the warp and woof of history. Not not ideas, not theories, but facts. Literal historical facts and events. There they are. Have you seen them? In the name of God, I say, and as you value your immortal soul, look at these for a moment. And forget your own pet questions and your own particular difficulties. Because, you see, in the third place, this prejudice leads to this. That they are totally incapable of explaining the facts. These Jews couldn't explain the miracle. They probably knew this man. Everybody knew him, poor fellow. He'd been carried there for 38 years. He was a well-known case, perhaps the most hopeless case at the pool of Bethesda. And everybody knew about him. Here is that very man. They meet him in the street, walking along and carrying the mat on which he's been lying. And on their hypothesis and on their view, there is no explanation whatsoever of the miracle. Isn't it amazing that they didn't address themselves to that? Isn't it surprising that they didn't stop and say, Men, what, what's happened to you? How's this taken place? Who's done this? Surely this is no man could do this. You haven't done it yourself. Well, who's done it? What is this? How have you been healed? They never asked that question. Never. Interested in the mat. Oh, that they had asked, how did he do it? Who is this who can do such things? 
But now they've got no explanation of the big thing that's confronting them. And you know mankind is still in that position if he doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Take the man, for instance, who says that Jesus Christ was only a man and no more, and just a teacher, and he didn't work miracles. Well, very well, if they say that, you see, what they're really confronted by is this. If he was only a man, well, then I say he was a blasphemer, because he claimed to be the Son of God and claimed to be equal with God. You can't have it both ways. If Jesus is only a man, well then I say he was either a blasphemer or else a lunatic. There's no choice between those two positions. And they're left in this position of utter contradiction, utterly inconsistent with themselves. He and all that has been done through him is left without any explanation at all. That this vital bit of history is meaningless, it's useless. Ah, yes, but the tragic thing about them, I always think, was just this. That they were so blinded and governed by this prejudice, that not only did they fail in the respects which I've been outlining, but they failed supremely, I think, at just this point. Why didn't they go to him and ask him to explain why he had done this thing on the Sabbath? They never asked him. Now, you see, if they'd been thinking clearly, they would have done so of necessity. Now, this is their problem. Here is a man who has healed another on the Sabbath, and he has caused him to carry his mat on the Sabbath, which to them was a breaking of the law. Now, if they'd only been able to think clearly and without prejudice, they, I think, would have worked it out like this. They'd have said, this man has been healed. This is undoubtedly a miracle. This must be the action of God. This man who has worked this miracle must have some divine power that we don't understand and we don't possess. And yet he's done this on a Sunday. Very well, let's go to him and let's ask him to explain himself. Let us go and say quite openly, we don't understand it. To us it seems very wrong, and yet we see that you've got a power that we haven't got. Can you give us an explanation? If there is one, in the name of God, let's have it. Do tell us, explain to us. They'd have gone to him in humility, even as Nicodemus went. And they would have asked, well now tell us, give us an explanation. They never did it. They were so blinded by prejudice. They were so sure of their own case. Ah, these clever trick questions. They never take them to Christ and all these problems. They denounce him instead of taking them to him and asking him to give his explanation. That's the real trouble with the unbeliever. My dear friend, if you only took your problems to Christ, if you only brought them to the church through whom Christ speaks, so many of your problems can be answered so easily. But men won't do that. They stand on their prejudices and they finally go to this last point, which is one of hatred and of rejection. Do you notice how it gets worse and worse? The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, persecute the man who healed this other, and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. And then when he says, My father worketh hitherto, and I work, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. That is the sorry story of unbelief. That's the analysis of men and women to whom the name of Jesus isn't sweet. He's someone to be argued against and to be dismissed and to be rejected. Is there anyone in this congregation who's in that position? Do you have to admit that the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not to you everything and you're all in all tonight? I say if that is the case with you, it is for these reasons. You've never really faced him. You've never gone to him. You've never realized who he is and what he's done. You've never even taken your problems to him. You've stood in your conceit and prejudice. 
and you've simply been concerned to get rid of him and to denounce him and to reject him. That's sheer prejudice. But oh, let us turn away from such a tragic and a miserable attitude. What miserable men these are. That in the face of a miracle, a glorious miracle of healing, a man set on his feet who'd been there impotent for 38 years. Isn't it incredible that they can persist in this attitude? Let's leave them, I say, and let's turn and look at these other men. What a different attitude. What accounts for it? Oh, I'm not going to keep you. It's all here and it's all so simple. Why is this man's attitude so different? Well, the first thing I think is this. Unlike those Jews, when this man looked into the face of Jesus Christ, he saw something that he'd never seen before. Ah, that's the trouble, isn't it? The Jews came to him. They came to Jesus and they looked at him, looked into the face of the Son of God looked into this incarnation of everlasting love, looked into those eyes with their divine depths, and simply put their questions in order to down him. But this man, when Jesus came and addressed him and said, Wilt thou be made whole? He looked into the eyes and he saw something that he'd never seen before. He saw hope, he saw an authority, he saw power, he saw divinity. He saw something in the face. He saw something, he heard something in the voice. Many people had gone to him at that pool and had offered their sympathy and perhaps that in a very vague and general way had offered their help. But he'd never heard a voice like this. I believe he said to himself what the soldier said later on, never men spake like this man. An authority, a power, Something in the question, wilt thou be made whole? He asked it in such a way as to say this, if you want it, you can have it. And he'd never felt that before. Everything was impotent, everything was but general. But here comes someone and says, wilt thou be made whole? And as he hears that wilt, he says, I see a possibility. He looked into the face of God. He saw something, he heard something, and he submitted, he obeyed. So when Christ said, stand up on thy feet, take up thy bed, Without thinking what he was doing, the man who hadn't been able to move for 38 years, he simply did it. He did it automatically, submitting to the authority of the Son of God. And that is what happens to every man who becomes a Christian. Suddenly or gradually it comes to him that here is someone who stands alone, not a man amongst men, but God come in the flesh. He hears his words, he feels the power of his vice, and at once he's disturbed, he's condemned perhaps at first, and then he feels the hope, and he responds, he believes, he trusts, and he obeys, and he rises out of his sin. That's the secret of the men, isn't it? And you see, what it leads to is this. That he the whole time goes on talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's aware of what Christ has done for him. Look at these men, their legalistic minds. Is it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed? He answered, he that made me whole. Stop talking about mats, he says. Talk about him. Stop talking about your law and look at me. There I've been for 38 years. Look at me now. He did it. He that made me whole. He talks about Christ and about Christ alone has been able to do for him. He that made me whole. This is the language of the Christian. Not your little arguments about miracles and providence and I don't understand this and I can't follow that and it says this here but that seems to contradict oh all's gone he and he that has made me whole 
He that has given me a new nature and a new life. He that has put me on my feet and made a new man of me. He that has given me strength to conquer where I formerly went down. Talk about him. Listen to him. This man gives Christ all the glory. You remember how Paul puts this? By the grace of God, I am what I am. I was a persecutor and a blasphemer, he says, and an injurious person, but I obtained mercy. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Don't look at me, don't speak to me, it's he. Do you remember Peter and John healing the men at the beautiful gate of the temple? And this man again who'd been impotent went bouncing, leaping, praising God into the temple and the people gathered and looked at Peter and John. And Peter said unto them, don't look at us as if by our own power or words we had made this impotent man to walk. His name, his name, by faith in his name hath given this man this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. They talk about Christ. Why? Well, because of what he's done for them. They gave him all the glory. And the next thing I notice is this. Did you notice it? Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple. Yes, in the temple. Worshipping and praising God. Not spending his Sunday reading the clever men in the clever Sunday newspapers with their difficulties and their problems and all their worldliness. No, no. In the temple of God. What for? Worshipping God. Praising God. Singing the anthems. Singing the hymns. Thanking him. A man on his feet who'd never been able to go there. Walking through the vestibule. Entering the house of God becoming a member of the church, joining the ranks of the redeemed in the temple. And the last thing, telling others about him, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. He felt to himself, when I tell them, they'll all go rushing after him. They'll say to him, do it to me. That's what the poor men expected. They didn't do that. But you see what he felt. He wanted to tell everybody about him. He wanted the whole world to go after him. He knew the need in the human heart and in the human breast. He wanted to say to them, he said to me, go, sin no more, lest the worst thing happen to you. And you, my friends, he would have said to them, unless you repent and go to him and be healed by him, the worst thing will happen to you. You are hell bound. But this Jesus has come into this world to save you and to redeem you, to rescue you and to set you free. To give you pardon and forgiveness. To reconcile you unto God and to make you children of God. He went and told the Jews. And you know it does come back to this. If I'm a Christian, well then I say that the supreme thing in life for me is to know Christ. Because through him alone I know God. And there my eternal future is safe. And I'm enabled to live even in this life and in this world. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his, his fear. Jesus is his prophet, his priest, his king, his lord. He's his all and in all. He's the son of God who so loved him that he came from heaven to earth and even went to the cruel, shameful death on the cross, that he might be forgiven and renewed and restored. Oh, beloved friend, I ask you, what is your reaction to him? Forget everything but just this one thing. Look at him. Look at Jesus of Nazareth. Look at him as he's depicted in the pages of this gospel. 
Look at him as he verifies all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Look at him as he continues his work in the church. Look at him as you see him transforming the lives of men, not only then, but subsequently throughout the long history of the Christian church. Look at him in revivals. Look at these big things. Look at the facts, the momentous facts. I cannot believe that you can go out of this service still just harboring your little arguments and difficulties. Forget the mat, I say, and see the man who's carrying it. And see that there is only one who can do such things. And that is Jesus of Nazareth. The Son of God, the Savior of your soul. Look at him. Look into his face. Look into his eyes. Listen to his word. Hear the authority. Feel the power. Go to him and submit. Take your problems to him. Take your questions. He'll never refuse you. He'll never reject you. You'll find him patient and compassionate. He'll listen to you. He'll allow you to speak your nonsense as he's listened to my nonsense. He'll listen and he'll answer. Go to him just as you are with all your problems and failings and difficulties. Go to him honestly and fall before him and listen to him. And he will make you whole. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.